case at 12. The Night Beat starts yes. right now. A noisy and damaging night in San Antonio. The hail coming down across the area this evening from pea sized to golf ball sized hail. This video coming in from Thousand Oaks and Jones Maltzberger area. KSAT photojournalist Bill Caldera was there to capture some of this for us tonight as those storms continue to roll through. And let's take a live look at Storm Chaser tonight out in the Sea World area where you can see the rain is coming down. And as you look in the median, you might even see some of the hail out there that we've been seeing throughout the evening. Our weather team has been on top of it all evening long. Let's get straight to meteorologist Adam Caskey. Adam. All right, well, the worst of it has pushed through most of San Antonio, and uh, if you can call up links for me, that would be great. But you have the uh, heaviest rain with some with some hail embedded within it here along 1604 281 and this is really the primary part of the thunderstorms and two storms now coming together and converging a bit near Calaveras and Browning Lakes. And this is pushing right southward into Atascosa County and Wilson County. You take a look at the warnings from the National Weather Service. Well, that's the lightning. We'll take a look at the warnings. And with these storms moving southward, at about 30, 35 miles per hour, the severe thunderstorm warning just got extended for uh, Wilson and Atascosa counties, and that warning is until 11 p.m. So that includes Floresville, Poteet, Pleasanton. We also still have an active warning out closer to Hallettsville. And between Hondo and Castroville, closer to Rio Medina, we've got another severe thunderstorm warning. That's until 10 15 p.m. And let's not forget northeastern Uvalde County with a severe thunderstorm warning until 10 15. Uh, PM also an aerial flood advisory indicating we have just some elevated water on the roadway. So the primary threat here has really been hail and straight line winds of 60 to 70 miles per hour. And I mean measured straight line winds. These aren't estimated by the Doppler radar. These are some of the measured straight line winds. The most recent threats when you look at these individual storms, according to our technology here is particularly large hail. And where you get into the bright purple and the black, that's usually a part of the storm where we have the main hail shaft and hail core. And you could see one to two inch diameter hail in this area. And when I say this area, I mean, we're talking south of San Antonio, far south side of town, 37 and 1604. So basically the La Soya neighborhood. And you get into the roads and between 281 and Interstate 37. That's where the main hail is at the moment in San Antonio. Those of you that got the big hail on the west side, the north side and downtown, it's moving out. Okay, it's gone. The worst is done with. You're in the clear for the rest of the night. But I do want to stress right here, moving into the Highway 90 corridor in Medina County is another severe storm. And this black area is potentially hail the size of ping pong balls, maybe a few the size of eggs that are pushing to the south. So our, our threat is basically all the way through about the midnight hour, roughly. Okay, that's where we have the potential for seeing some more of this severe weather, but that's generally in places where we haven't gotten it yet. Our atmosphere is a little worked over in here in San Antonio. You can see this stuff popping up here along I-10 between Bernie and Comfort, and you look at that and there's just a few little lightning strikes within it, not much, but then you compare it to the other storms that really hit the ripe atmosphere and all those lines are the the cloud to ground lightning strikes that have been going on. So that just shows that what we have developing on the backside is basically just little downpours that have popped up and will add to our aquifer and whatnot. But yeah, that's a question I was going to ask you, Adam, is that I see all those storms that are still in the hill country. It's a little different path, though, than we saw with the earlier storms. It is. And um, the earlier storms now have basically used up a lot of that energy in the atmosphere and what we have behind it could have some lightning and thunder and whatnot, but we're not expecting the same type of weather. We're not expecting a round two out of it uh, from that. But you talked about path and you can look at the hail path of these storms, the actual paths that the, the hail course took. And these were all moving from basically the northwest to the southeast. All of these hail cores here, and this is just the hail hail cores. I think over the past um, hour and a half or so, yeah, because this this actually does spread quite a bit far 
northward. So we can adjust the time frame on that for the next time to show you. But those are the tracks that those hail cores have taken. We had tennis ball size hail reported by emergency managers near SeaWorld and golf ball size hail to hen egg two inch diameter hail uh, basically within this swath here from Camp Bullis and Bergheim southward along 281 and into downtown and on the southeast side of town. We'll have a full update and Sarah Spive is going to have some photos and videos to share with you coming right up. Thank you, Adam. Speaking of those videos, we want to get to some of them that are just new into our newsroom. This is out of Canyon Lake tonight. The sky, a mix of red and blue there with bursts of lightning, as you can see. Flashes of light all captured on camera. This video is courtesy of KSAT viewer Jeff Hazler. And let's take a live look with TransGuide right now. This is a look around at several of our cameras. This is an area of concern live right now, 151 and Loop 410 West. I saw Adam and Sarah talking about it earlier. What we believe is happening there is it's an area under construction and they are uh, it's underwater. So they've asked people to actually get off at that area. Again, that's 151 and Loop 410. And actually uh, our storm tracker is heading that way right now, but you can see 281 in Hildebrand, a deluge not too long ago. Things are drying out, but right now the storm has moved to the southern part of the city and into Wilson and Atascosa County. Meantime, CPS reporting several outages tonight as well. At last check, 26,582 customers were impacted. Of course, we will be tracking the weather throughout this newscast and later in the show. An abrupt change for seniors at Southside ISD, a virtual graduation postponed, and now we're learning there's an investigation into concerns of possible coronavirus exposure among students. Students, parents, and the district are now speaking out. The night team, Stephen Cavazos, with this Night Beat update. A moment of celebration. Parents putting on a parade for seniors at Southside ISD on Saturday, an event the district says they were aware of. I felt pretty proud of myself for like the, all the hard work I've done for the past 12 years. Adrian Mancha says he was on top of the world and looking forward to graduation. Those plans now on hold. It just kind of died down for me, the energy. Today, students were going to begin the three day process of filming their entrances at the auditorium for a virtual graduation. A letter sent out just yesterday confirmed that would not be happening. Mancha's father worries it will be too late. The further and further that we go along, the less graduates are going to be willing to attend. That ceremony now scheduled for June 9th through the 11th at Southside High School. The change in plans came after a student came forward with concerns of exposure to COVID-19. In a statement, the district says they're proud of the student who came forward, but they do not know how many students may have been exposed and are assessing the situation. It's not just about us right now. We have to think of our, our neighbors. We have to think of others. One senior who didn't want to go on camera says delaying the ceremony is the right decision and wanted her classmates to know this. This is a stepping stone. This is a, a means to an end for this chapter, but it's not the end of the book. Now, the district did add while they are hopeful for the June dates, they said that there could still be delays or even cancellations, depending on if the city or state extends any restrictions. Reporting by Southside ISD, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. There was a slight increase when it came to our latest numbers of COVID-19 cases in Bear County, but those aren't the only indicators to watch out for when it comes to the response in our county. The night team's Jaffney Gray tracking it all for us tonight. The number of cases in Bear County has gone up by 45, bringing the total to 2,525 cases. A new death was also added, bringing the total of deaths to 70. A breakdown of those numbers, 92 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital, 39 in ICU. While there are recoveries, there's still 1,118 active cases. Mayor Ron Nirenberg says even though the numbers are going up, including in our hospitals, we're still in good shape. The time it takes to double our cases is slowing down, and as testing continues, 3.7 six percent of those are positive. Our positivity rate over the last several weeks has gone down. We maintain a strong level of capacity in our hospitals and the severity of illness is also under control. We are seeing that that number of positive patients tick up, but they're moderately ill. In comparison to surrounding counties, Bear County COVID-19 numbers and deaths are lower. As of yesterday, Harris County sits at over 10,000 cases with 221 deaths. Dallas County has nearly 9,000 cases with 211 deaths. Travis County with nearly 3,000 cases and 85 deaths. And Tarrant County, just over 5,000 cases with 144 deaths. Nirenberg says the battle of COVID-19 is far from over and hopes people will continue to protect our community as Texas reopens. Making sure 
that you're maintaining physical distancing, not engaging in high-risk activities, and generally cooperating with one another. Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News. You come up tomorrow on GMSA, of course, the very latest on the storm that moved through tonight. And in the midst of this pandemic, one local woman using her time at home to capture the moments of those around her through pictures. You don't want to miss her message of strength and what she hopes everyone will remember as we go through this difficult time. That's tomorrow on GMSA. I want to get back to our weather coverage tonight. This is a live look with Trans Guide US 90 at Medeo Creek. Uh, lightning, wind, rain, and hail experienced in our area. We also have video coming in from 1604 and Blanco. Look at that. Hail seen in that area within the last hour. That is cardboard covering the windshield in hopes of offering some protection for that windshield of the vehicle. Yeah, that's probably Stone not a bad idea. Yeah, exactly. The Stone Oak area, just one of many parts of town that saw hail tonight. Now, Adam, I saw some photos that ranged in size from pea size, and I even saw one that looked as big as a baseball. Yeah, and we saw pea sized heat hail here at the station. As a matter yeah, of fact. and you know, we saw a lot of the pea size, a lot of the nickel size hail. That's what blanketed the ground, but embedded within that then every so often you get those bigger ones that come down briefly, and those are the real damaging ones. All right, right now we have one, two, three, four severe thunderstorm warnings that are in effect across South Texas, including Southern Bear County, Atascosa, Wilson counties. Also, you get closer to Utopia and we could have some hail the size of uh, tennis balls to baseballs there right now. So I'm going to put this into motion. We'll be back with a comprehensive update, let you know you, you can expect the rest of the night, have some photos to share with you and much more coming up. The weather causing problems here in Florida, it delayed a return to space. A disappointing development on Florida's space coast after the historic launch of the SpaceX Crew Dragon was scrubbed. Two Houston astronauts were set to take off in a SpaceX spacecraft. Rosanna Oregon with our sister station KPRC is in Florida tonight and reports the next attempt at a launch will likely happen on Saturday. It was a launch that many had dreamed to see, the SpaceX Demo 2 mission. We were really excited. It's our second time trying to see a launch. Um, we tried it again last year and it was canceled, but we listened to the live feed the whole way up here. We traveled from uh, the West Coast. NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley were supposed to test this vehicle, the SpaceX Crew Dragon atop a Falcon 9 rocket. But because of orbital dynamics involving the capsule's ability to meet up with the International Space Space Station, the window was instantaneous, only a minute long. It is what it is. You know, you're taking a chance. Anticipation building, the beaches filling up. It was really amazing to watch them saying goodbye to their families this afternoon on our ride up here. Uh, we actually pulled over to so we could actually see it together. The couple is from Pennsylvania, but came here to Cocoa Beach Pier. The capsule, though, stayed on the rocket just as the weather stayed in the red zone because of unsafe skies, thunderstorm clouds and a threat of lightning, a risk just great enough to stop the mission for safety. But the better news is the crew vehicles and teams were ready, all checks passing with flying colors. And while the mission was scrubbed, everyone will just try again. We can't wait till Saturday. We'll be back. Take a live look outside with Storm Chaser right now. Our Justin Horn out on the roadways. Our weather team has had a very active night here in the uh, weather center. Several severe thunderstorm warnings are out right now. Let's get right to Adam Kasky. Yeah, and I'm here with Sarah Spivey as well. We're tracking all the very latest information and uh, looking at looking at the storm activity that we have out there right now. If we can get the link system called up and we'll show you what we're talking about, and that's the multiple severe thunderstorm warnings that we have in effect at this moment <laughs> as a live TV to a different camera. Yeah, uh, it's multiple severe thunderstorm warnings all within those orange polygons. And this is primarily for hail, which could be two, three inches in diameter and even some wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour. Actually, the International Airport in San Antonio did measure a wind gust of over 60 miles per hour. I think it was like 64 or 65 miles per hour. But severe thunderstorm warning, we're talking Edwards County into Real County, okay? And another one, Uvalde County moving into Medina County. These are all moving southeasterly. That likely has some large hail uh, within this one here. This is just north of Sabinal. So Sabinal to Hondo, watch out, this one is headed in your direction. 
Then you get eastward and the worst of it is over with in San Antonio. Moving through Bernie, we have more areas of rain, but that's just some soaking rain, little bit of lightning and thunder. That's nothing severe. The severe activity right now is moving into Wilson County and just clipping northern Atascosa County. We're talking right along 37, 1604 and, and 181. So 181 and 37 right between there going southward into Wilson County. That's the area of concern in terms of the large hail and the potential uh, for that hail that could be one, two inches in diameter and a wind gust of 60 miles per hour. So our, our, our technology is throwing, showing us the main threat is right there east of 37. That black and white indicates the potential for about two inch diameter hail. Now we look farther east of San Antonio and we have more activity as well. And even a severe thunderstorm, this is just northeast of Cuero at the moment. And this is a severe thunderstorm warning. That's southern Lavaca County, northeastern Cuero County. That's until 11 PM, large hail being the primary threat with this. OK, so in San Antonio, I want to stress the primary threat has passed and now it's moving into Wilson County, Floresville, that area in particular. OK, let's talk about uh, this hail and talk about how it even um, how it develops. I mean, we can we can compare the hail formation sizes, but how about how it actually forms? This is very interesting. So this is what we saw in our thunderstorms tonight. You get these hailstones that get carried up and down in the storm in the updraft and the downdraft. And within the top of that storm, we have what's called super cooled liquid water. Yeah, liquid water that's below freezing. Once it hits those hailstones when they go up, makes a hailstone bigger. It freezes onto it. It keeps doing that and it cycles through and eventually it overcomes the updraft gets too heavy and it falls out and you can actually count how many times that hailstone went up and down within the thunderstorm by looking at the rings on the hailstone. Sarah's got a good example of that there. Yeah, Adam, this picture was sent in through our KSAC Connect feature. You can clearly see the layers around these hailstones, which are about golf ball size. This was out at Deerfield. Uh, and what's really interesting here is that you can almost see exactly where that was sent up again, kind of like a, a snowball, but an ice ball really. And then gravity takes over in these fall. And man, there were so many pictures coming into our KSAC Connect feature. This was around 920, close to the airport. Uh, this one, golf ball sized hail clearly around 915 in the evening. And this was the Fox Run neighborhood near Nacogdoches and the Pompeii restaurant there. What looks like at least egg sized hail. But as Adam was saying, we've had reports of up to 10 Tennis ball sized hail out near the SeaWorld area from earlier today. If you have pictures, send them into our KSAC Connect app. Wait until the storm passes, however, because we don't want anybody out there uh, when it's storming. So we should begin to start to see most of the storm activity end around midnight. Most of the evening will be quiet and we'll really just be looking at a nice quiet start to the day tomorrow. For your Thursday, just know that it's going to be warm near 88 degrees and we do have another chance for isolated storms in the afternoon. We'll have to watch out for the potential for strong weather again, but the keyword here is isolated, not this widespread storms that you, we've been seeing tonight. Then looking ahead into the weekend, looks like we're finally going to get a break from the storms. EC, Steve. We really have seen some amazing photos and videos through our KSAC Connect app. That's exactly what yeah. I was going to say. What I was going to say is our viewers are also doing a very good job of giving us something to compare it to perspective, whether yes. it's a golf yeah. ball or a nickel or a quarter or whatever they mm -hmm. have. They've done a great job and we want to commend you for that tonight. All right, let's talk sports and contracts and a guy named JJ. JJ Watt, perhaps one of the greatest players in the history of the Houston Texans is going into this season, by the way, without guaranteed money. Does he, does he want a contract extension before the season begins? He will tell us. And Lefty wants to make this an annual event. Don't blame him. Coming up. I'm just going out there and trying to prove my worth and to help this team win games and do everything that I can uh, to earn and make sure that these people know that I'm, I'm worth it. 
All right, with only two seasons left on his current contract, Houston, Texas star J.J. Watt reacting today when asked, how important is it for him to finish his career in Houston in big board sports? Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Houston, Texas star J.J. Watt says he is not seeking the contract extension, even though the two years remaining on his current deal are not guaranteed. Speaking to reporters today via Zoom, the three-time defensive player of the year, was asked if he will seek a contract extension this offseason since he's scheduled to be paid $15.5 million this season, another $17.5 million dollars in 2021 none of which is guaranteed especially when you consider he's dealt with severe injuries in three of his last four years in the league no no i don't think that's necessary um i think that uh i fully understand and respect the situation that i'm in at the moment um and what's happened in the past few years so i'm not i'm not going to sit here and, and demand anything uh because i'm i'm going out there to prove what i'm worth and and i, I believe that's the right situation for everybody. I don't think, I think if I went back and asked for an extension, more money, anything right now, I think that would be uh, the wrong move. Watt was also asked how he was personally protecting himself during the COVID-19 pandemic, and only threatens the start of the NFL season, but a season that could be played without full stadiums. I don't really leave my house a whole lot. I go pick up food. I picked up Cotter about it the other day, which is incredible as always. Uh, I. But other than that, it's me and the dog sitting here. Kay's actually up in Chicago now because they're starting to get trained back up for uh, a potential tournament-style season for them, I know. Um, so now it's just me and the dogs down here in Houston. And uh, they love that because I throw the tennis ball 650 times an hour. And uh, when I'm not training, that's literally all I do. <laughs> College football conferences and television networks have agreed to hold off announcing start times for the early season games. Typically, the network would announce the game times on June the 1st, but now they decided to wait a few weeks to see if how both the NBA and the NHL fare in their return from the COVID-19 pandemic. The college football season is set to kick off on August 29th. Iowa State Athletic Director Jamie Pollard here has informed Cyclones fans that football games will be played this season at no more than 50% capacity at Jack Trice Stadium, pending a change in state and local health guidelines. That means no more than 30,000 fans. About 22,000 season tickets have been renewed, leaving only about 8,000 seats to be filled. Fans not renewing their season tickets and making their Cyclone Club donation by June 12th won't be allowed to attend games unless guidelines change and capacity exceeds 50%. Even with that, Pollard wrote on the team website that after consulting with campus officials, they have concluded there is no reasonable way to guarantee that no one will contract the COVID-19 virus. Disney World in Orlando has announced it will begin a phased-in reopening of the theme park starting on July 11th. That fits nicely into the plan for the NBA to restart in late July at the Wide World of Sports Complex in Florida. Barring any last-minute changes, that appears to be the target for restarting the league in late July in, 20, in the 220-acre site, I should say. That is three arenas and plenty of hotel space for players and staff. The only debate now appears to be when the NBA does return, how will the season continue? With regular season games, play in tournament style games, or just the playoffs? Several scenarios have been presented to the league, including Mark Cuban's proposal last night that would involve all 30 NBA teams in a play-in style format to help decide the playoff seedings. Some players feel, including Damian Lillard, that if his team, in this case the Portland Trailblazers, do have a legitimate, do not have a legitimate shot at making the postseason, you can count him out. Lefty wants more made-for-TV golf. <laughs> Next. The return of Major League Baseball may hinge on the ability of the league and its Players Association to arrive at an agreement on finances rather than a safety agreement on the coronavirus. Right now, the two sides are very far apart following the team owner's latest pay proposal that scraps the original 50-50 revenue split made by the owners on May the 11th. Now, under the new plan submitted on Tuesday, a rookie at the Major League minimum would keep about 47% of his original salary this year, while multi-millionaires such as Mike Trout and Garrett Cole would lose more than 77% of their salary that no surprise to anyone is extremely disappointing to the players. Additionally, the two sides also remain far apart on health and safety protocols in an attempt to jumpstart the season around the 4th of July. I had the coffee. I got to activate the calves and I got to step on one here. <laughs> Out on the heels of the most successful made-for-TV golf event in cable history, Phil Mickelson wants more. Lefty was a big part of the Champions for Charity golf event that included Tiger Woods, team with Tom Brady, and Mickelson with Peyton Manning. And Phil telling the L.A. Times he would like to see the match become an annual event to showcase the talents of guys like Steph Curry, Michael Jordan, and maybe even, of course, crowd favorite Bill Murray. Wouldn't that be great to see him out there doing this? That would be awesome. Cinderella yeah. story. Yeah. <laughs> From Augusta. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great. Thanks, Greg. You got it. We'll be right back.
It is crunch time for San Antonio water theme parks. The governor has given Texas water parks the green light to begin operating starting Friday. The night team's Patty Santos tells us park managers are now scrambling to hire staff and get in compliance with social distancing guidelines. We have no water running yet. We're still trying to fight the storms to empty the pools, to finish painting, to refill the pools. James Kinney with Splash Town says they're scurrying to be ready to reopen by June 13th, about two months later than the normal season. I'm still frantically ordering face masks and sanitizer and sanitizer stations, uh, signage for COVID protocol. Uh, there's just a lot of uh, new things that we've got to do to, to get ready this year. Because theme parks will only be allowed to have a 25% capacity, a lot of them are asking that customers buy their tickets ahead of time. Center Bomb New Braunfels has set a mid-June reopening date. The River Bluff water experience at the JW Marriott Resort in the Hill Country is gearing up for a June 15th reopening. Morgan's Wonderland says they're finalizing a plan and will have an answer later this week. As far as SeaWorld San Antonio is concerned, an opening date remains unclear. Six Flags Fiesta Texas says Whitewater Bay will open when the governor gives all theme parks the green light to reopen. But they have already announced extensive safety measures, which includes an online reservation system to manage attendance, advanced security checks, and strict social distancing guidelines. Back over at Splashtown. We can hope that the customers adhere to these guidelines and uh, and frankly, what we're going to ask everybody to do is just be nice. It's a different time. The water park is also looking to fill 150 positions, including kitchen staff, janitors, and lifeguards. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. I want to show you some new video tonight from our Sky 12 pilot who would have been taking off from the airport, but the weather kept him grounded. Several lightning strikes caught on camera. There's still photos and update on outages in our area. CPS reporting 27,844 customers impacted tonight. That's a bit of an increase since we checked in about 30 minutes ago. Let's check in with meteorologist Adam Kasky for the latest Adam. By the way, I, my family tells me we're without power. Okay, right now. so you're one of the 27,000 or so, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, because a lot of people are without power just due to the uh, lightning strikes and even some strong winds. This is a 3D view of the storm that's near Sabinal, and this is a slice of it. And you see where the purple and black goes way up into the storm. That's likely the large hail that's associated with it. And this storm in particular right here um, is starting to exhibit some characteristics on the radar that would that would indicate a little bit of rotation and the potential for maybe a brief tornado, just something to keep in the back of your mind. This is a severe thunderstorm and this severe thunderstorm warning uh, remains in effect for this cell that you see right here. But this is moving into Sabinal and moving southward at about 30 miles per hour. You get into San Antonio, all is clear, a little bit of rain left over, and we'll have a few showers here or there. But then here's another severe thunderstorm that's between Poth and Pleasanton, and this is moving southeastward right along the Atascosa County line. And this is another severe thunderstorm warning. You can see that warning box that's in effect until 11 p.m. Give you an idea of the movement of these storms. Put the radar on play for you. And there you go. I'll get rid of these warnings so you don't see as many boxes cluttering it up. But this is where they're all headed southeastward. Our main threat is through about midnight. And then really the, the, the threat and risk factor for severe weather diminishes. And far east of town, we're not seeing as much activity anymore. We're going to have a full update. More photos and your forecast coming right up. This pandemic is ever changing and it can be an information overload and some of that information isn't even true. So we take this time in our show to feature a local expert and ask questions from you, our viewers. Tonight we're joined by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Courtney. We want to start with Governor Abbott's announcement this week, reopening Texas. It included reopening water parks, amusement parks, sports for adults. A lot of people each phase that he announces this reopening want to know from our local leaders, is this too soon, do you think, to open these types of businesses? You know, with each successive opening uh, that the governor has performed, uh, we know that it's going to introduce more activity to our community. And so there's going to be more chance more vectors for infection. Um, the challenge for that is that we don't have the benefit of data to see how the previous phases of opening worked and whether or not we're staying on track. Uh, so it is uh, a bit hasty. 
the good news for San Antonio, though, is that we have been in a very strong position with all of our indicators. Everything that we track to make sure that we can begin to open safely is in a good spot. But, you know, we, we want to make sure it stays there. And, and the, the speed at which we are opening prevents us from really watching to see the effects of each stage. We hope it works, but we're going to be vigilant. Absolutely. Keep looking at that curve for sure. Uh, yeah. Sticking with the economy, last week we heard from you and Judge Wolf about that $1.5 million micro business grant that is incoming. A lot of our viewers, once that was announced, said what business, what businesses can apply, when can they apply, and is this first come, first serve like that last round of loans and grants? Yeah, so the good news for uh, the city, uh, businesses in the city and the, the county is that there is a really fo real focused effort from the commissioner's court as well as city council to make resources available from the CARES Act directly available to our small business community. Uh, the county has gone through already a funding process. The city council starts that tomorrow and we look to ratify that plan on June 4th, which is uh, uh, the following week. Once those funds are allocated, People can go to our website, covid19.sanantonio.gov. There is an assistance button and there's resources underneath the small businesses uh, that people will be able to access. It will be administered through the lift fund and we're looking to put a substantial amount of funding in there to help our small business community. I know they'll be happy to hear that. Uh, we need them. They're the backbone of our economy. Absolutely. Let's turn to some medical questions now. As today in your briefing, you said that hospital numbers are slightly up. We're now at 92, and we know those have been slightly increasing. Uh, are those hospital increases concerning to you as we continue, as we were just talking about, to open more businesses? Yeah, the uptick in hospital um, patients positive for COVID-19 is a concern, but it's just one of many indicators that we're watching. Um, the good news for us is that all the other indicators are trending in the right direction or are stable. We know that this vaccine, that the uh, disease, the, it, the virus is not going to all of a sudden go away. So there is going to be a level of the virus out there. We have to work to contain it and make sure that the most vulnerable members of our community are safe from it. And the good news on that front is that we're doing that. Um, the, the capacity numbers in the hospital are stable. Um, the number of severe um, infections in our community in the hospitals are stable. ICU and ventilator numbers have stayed roughly in the same spot for about a month now. And um, all of the other warning uh, in progress indicators that we watched, the doubling rate of infections, um, hospital capacity, the, the, um, the, le the level of severity, all these other indicators are in the right spot. So we are watching that one indicator uh, of a number of positives overall just increase in the hospitals. We, we're going to remain vigilant on that, but everything else looks to be in place so far, and we're, we're, uh, we're happy about that. And one of the one things that we've talked about since the very beginning is the testing. You also mentioned in your briefing the pop-up testing locations that we've been doing at SAC and Highland High School starting tomorrow. You can go with a doctor's note, without a doctor's note, with or without symptoms. So this has kind of been an ever-changing thing. Is yeah. the end goal for you, for everyone in San Antonio in our area to have a test? Are you urging everyone and anyone to be tested? Well, you know, we've, we've, we've sort of hit our goal, which is not that everyone gets tested, but that everyone who needs a test can get a test or has access to a test. There are no barriers anymore. Um, you don't have to have symptoms. You don't have to have a doctor's appointment. You don't have to have insurance or even money to be able to access a test. Um, but you do, you should have a reason to get a test. Again, this is a diagnostic to tell if you have a virus, you have the virus or not. The reasons for getting a test is whether or not you think you've been exposed to someone who has COVID-19 or whether you have even the mildest of symptoms, then you should get a test. But, you know, if, if you're, you just want the reassurance that you don't have COVID-19, that's probably not a good reason to get a test. We have been working to uh, make sure that we get up to 4,000, or, or excuse me, up to 3,000 testing capacity a day. We were trying to get to that number by June 1. Good news is we've far exceeded that number and we've done it weeks in advance. We're already right around 4,000 test capacity a day. Um, that number is higher than the actual demand for tests at the moment. We're really trying to push those tests out to make sure that people who need them understand there is no barrier to getting one. And that's a good to point out a lot of the medical experts we've been talking to, including some on your team, have said this is a point in time test. So you could still get it right. after that. You could have had it before, which is why the antibody test we've talked about as well. 
That's right. And, and the antibody test, again, is, is not sure science mm -hmm. right now. The, mm -hmm. the CDC just released, released guidance. It's, the antibody tests are very inaccurate. So, you know, what we have to go on right now is, is again, the health guidance, maintain physical distancing, wearing a mask when you're within six feet of someone not in your household, doing all the things with sanitation and washing your hands that you know is necessary when a virus is out there. That kind of common sense will help us get through this pandemic and, and be able to weather this storm until there, there is a vaccine available. You've mentioned before also, as we've reported, we got some video of you helping out. You help distribute thousands of PPE pledge kits to small businesses so they can start to reopen safely. Uh, first, can you just remind our viewers what those what the pledge entails, the pledge itself? Sure. So the Open Texas plan from the governor is really a set of minimum standards to open up. Um, what our health community did and the business community here in San Antonio has come up with a set of best practices, those things that need to happen that should happen in a particular business, whatever the sector may be, to give consumers confidence, to give employees the safety and, and the general public the safety that they need that, to know that we're gonna open safely and that we can see a very, very vigorous recovery with this economic um, opening. And so that pledge is a pledge on behalf of the business to adhere to all those best practices. So all the businesses, and there were over 6,000 businesses today that signed the pledge, were able to come up, come and pick up a, a kit that included uh, sanit sanitizer, face masks, things like that to help them get started. But that PPE, the, those materials are just one element of, of sticking to the pledge. Our, our community has really um, come together on this our business community in particular. That's why I'm confident that if we continue to mind the health guidance, we will be able to open safely and, and begin to experience a recovery. That leads right into my next question. A lot of cities, there have been people that are filing a lot of complaints. Do you feel that businesses are opening safely? That's what our viewers wanted to know. Have you had a lot of those complaints similar to other really large cities like ours? The, the vast majority are. And, you know, the, the business owners, the small business community in particular, wants to open safely. And, and this is their livelihoods. So they want to do it the right way. The vast majority are being careful about it. There's always the bad actor. There are always, always uh, you know, the, the, the folks that just think that this doesn't apply to them. And unfortunately, that kind of thing can ruin it for everyone. So we are asking the community to, to call in a complaint. If you have, if you see a violation, Call it in, 210-207-SAPD. That way we can go educate that particular business that it's not just about them. Their uh, adherence to the guidelines will benefit our entire community. But yeah, we do get those complaints. Uh, luckily, they are far, vastly outnumbered by the numbers of, of businesses and the small businesses that are doing it the right way. Anything else you would like to add? Tell our viewers before we go. Um, no, I, I just want to thank everyone out there that, you know, this has not been easy for everyone, for anyone. Um, you know, people have to get accustomed to doing things that we never thought we would have to do, like a wear, wearing of a mask in public, uh, staying away from people we love. Um, but, but it's working. And I will say that as long as we listen to our doctors, our medical professionals, and use common sense, we can get through this. It will be some time before there's a vaccine, but we can, life can, can begin to go on as close to normal as we can allow it, um, life can go on if we just stick to the guidance and exercise some common sense, life protect can, one another. Life can go on. Thank you so much. Right. Mayor Ron Nuremberg, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Courtney. Stay safe in the weather out there. Thanks, you too. All right, we'll be right back. Ever wonder what goes into making it a good day on the golf course? Well, as I found out, it all starts overnight while you were sleeping. That's coming up tomorrow on Good Morning San Antonio. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Take a live look outside with live cam. Our weather team has been tracking these storms since about 7 o'clock tonight. Been a very busy night. Yeah, it was, it, all in all, it's a fast moving storm, yeah. but there's still parts of our viewing area getting hit right now, Adam and Sarah.
Yeah, we, we've been, you know, watching this since it was up in the hill country and just uh, one little storm turned into a cluster of storms pushing south where now we have several warnings and we've had a lot of hail out there tonight. A lot of hail. You know, it's been a while since we've seen these long track hail tracks through San Antonio. A lot of people got some hail. We're going to show pictures, but first Adam's going to go ahead and take a look at the radar. Yeah, the places that are under threat right now in terms of the severe weather, we're talking between Floresville and Kennedy. That's where we have a severe thunderstorm warning with a large hail likely and maybe some gusts up to 60 miles per hour. And speaking of gusts up to 60, the airport in San Antonio measured a wind gust of 65 miles per hour, which is considered severe. Also, this storm right here, just south of Sabinal now, uh, moving into northwestern Frio County. This is another strong, severe thunderstorm, likely some golf ball, ping pong ball size hail with it, and some straight line winds potentially of 60 miles per hour. And we got another one up in the hill country, moving into Real County. We'll keep an eye on this one. This one likely to have some large hail as well, and the potential for those strong winds. But in San Antonio, just a few little showers left over, and that's it. That's all we have. The threat has passed for San Antonio east of town. Uh, really just a few showers left over as well. So we're just looking at those few remaining thunderstorms that are out there. Here's their motion just to give you an idea. And as for the actual rainfall totals, uh, we can look at just these six hour totals. And, you know, our aquifer has been really loving the rainfall lately. You look at these swaths of rain and, you know, unfortunately, these were also the where the hail hit. But in those areas, we picked up one to two inches of rainfall. Uh, so that's the rain situation right now. As I said in San Antonio, the threat is over, but we had some large hail. We're talking egg size and even tennis ball size. For more photos on what happened out there, let's go to Sarah Spivey. Yeah, thank you, Adam. I think it's important to note, too, that the airport saw a little bit more than an inch and a half of rain on top of the four plus inches of rain that we've already seen for the month. So the month of May is going to go down as a fairly rainy month. We usually see about four inches of rain, and we've already seen probably somewhere along the lines of five and a half to six inches of rain easily. But uh, you all, our viewers, really came through tonight by sending in pictures to our KSAC Connect app, which is on our weather app, because you were our eyes on the ground to verify what we were seeing on the radar. What we were seeing on the radar was the potential for golf ball or greater sized hail, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, now, this picture was sent in around 908. That's when they heard the hail and, and experienced it. Half dollar sized hail with visible rings around these hail stones and that's when you see them go up into high up into the storm. They collect some more water freeze and that's why you see those rings on those hailstones. This one was really impressive to me. This is at bitters in 1604. You can see the golf ball there. Uh, this person did a great job of showing a object we know the size of like a golf ball and comparing them to the hailstones. Notice that in the foreground you can see those large golf ball sized hail, but in the background hail blanketing the yard, this person's yard. And that's very impressive. We had a lot of small hail, but inside of that we had a ton of large hail as well. So thank you for those pictures. You can continue to send in pictures through the KSAC Connect feature on our weather app, and we'd love to show them online as well. I wanted to go ahead and take you through a storm timeline so that you can rest easy tonight. Now, while we still do have those severe thunderstorm warnings out of Medina County and south of San Antonio, this is for San Antonio tonight. Even around midnight, we may still have a few lingering showers and a few rumbles of thunder. But as we head into the early morning hours tomorrow, we can say goodbye to the rain, at least temporarily, because unfortunately, the way our atmosphere is set up, we do have another chance for storms tomorrow. But the key is the chance for storms tomorrow is isolated, only 30%. Other than that, it'll be partly cloudy and a high near 90. Thankfully, looking ahead, we do have a, a nice break in the storminess. In fact, we'll be near 90 degrees on the weekend and sunny. EC, Steve. Thank you, Sarah. All right, Adam, you have something you wanted to say? If they can call my mic up, yeah. One reminder we like to give after these hail events uh, has to do with insurance. Take note of the time yeah. and date right now because we don't always have weather records of every neighborhood. So for insurance purposes at home, take note time, date, and photos. Right, and, it, and maybe date the photos. Yes. And then you take hit, hit, you know, two hailstones with one. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, we'll be, we'll right, be right back. back. <laughs>Tonight, the country passed a grim milestone. More than 100,000 lives now lost to the coronavirus in less than three months. 14 states continuing to see an uptick in cases as various parts of the country continue to reopen. 
ABC's Zareen Shaw has the story. On Wednesday, a somber milestone as the country passed 100,000 deaths in the coronavirus pandemic. Some of those who've left us, Coach Paul Logan, an Indianapolis high school coach. Five-year-old kindergartner Skylar Herbert, daughter of Detroit first responders. Rolando Aravina was a communications field technician at Verizon, sent to a New York hospital to help prepare for the surge. A week later, he fell sick. He just looked at me and he said, Mel, I never knew a love like this before, and I love you so much. Democratic nominee for president Joe Biden spoke about the milestone. There are moments in our history so grim, so heartrending, that they're forever fixed in each of our hearts, a shared grief. Today is one of those moments. The moment is muddled with mixed messages from the White House. President Trump made no mention of those lost during his trip to Florida. But he was seen again without a mask, the same day his top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, talked about why it's important. I mean, I wear it for the reason that I believe it is effective. It is, it's not 100% effective. I mean, it's sort of respect for another person and have that other person respect you. You wear a mask, they wear a mask, you protect each other. Those masks, gloves, and temperature checks being used by many businesses, including salons, as most California counties open up. Major theme parks also implementing safety measures like SeaWorld in Orlando and Disney, ABC's parent company, planning Disney World's phased reopening, both on July 11th. Well, I think what's going to look different, first of all, is going to be the presence of masks on all the cast and all the guests. That's obviously going to be a very different look and feel. Uh, you're going to see a lot less density than you normally might see at a Disney park. More precautions to avoid more of these heartbreaking milestones. Dr. Fauci says he is also optimistic that a vaccine could be ready by the end of the year. Soreen Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. That's it for the night beat, the very latest on the storms on GMA.